Thank you, Jaime, and uh, we are at an exciting time. I'd like to start by also acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land uh, and their um, centuries of caring for the land, the animals, and the environment on which we continue to share knowledge to this day. Um, I think what Jaime's told you about is we're at a very exciting time in the faculty currently. What started out as the germ of an idea that we'd really like to enable Indigenous students to come and to have the experience and to graduate uh, as veterinarians and animal scientists. Um, a germ of an idea that started back in 1998 with changes to our admissions program at that time. We've seen that has been growing, building momentum. And so now we're poised at a very exciting stage where not only do we have a very uh, a wonderful group of Indigenous students with us, we've got a pipeline of excited young high school students who are anxious to come and join the faculty and the university and become veterinarians and animal scientists. We've got research working in remote and Indigenous communities around animal health. And we're thinking very deeply about how uh, we can contribute more, particularly by ensuring that each and every one of our graduates has a real depth of expertise in cultural competence. Because if we have cultural competence as a core skill for each and every one of our graduates, and a good understanding of how that applies in Australia for our Indigenous peoples, um, it, that is just as relevant. Those skills are equally relevant and applicable for those graduates wherever they might be working. May it be in the back um, the mountains of Laos and Cambodia or across in Africa, wherever it is that students and graduates go to work, cultural competence is something that uh, enriches and enables them to do, to achieve so much more in their careers and to contribute so much more. So I think we're at a very exciting time. And it's my great pleasure, um, in addition to acknowledging um, the generous support that we've had through our uh, DVC Indigenous office that's made much of this possible recently, but also to um, acknowledge the, the very deep engagement we see across the faculty. Many people are excited, enthusiastic and involved. And today we're going to hear from one of our um, veterinary leaders in the faculty, uh, Professor Michael Ward is Professor of uh, Food Safety and Veterinary Public Health in our faculty. He's an alumnus of University of Queensland, uh, went to Davis and did a master's and PhD programs in veterinary public health, uh, has worked a number of universities in the States, is a board certified um, epidemiologist and has spent a number of years working in Department of Primary Industries in Australia. And then we were very fortunate to be able to recruit him to come to Sydney, I guess about seven years ago now, is it Michael? Something like that. So. Um, since Michael's been with us, he's generated a fantastically broad and deep research program across a whole range of areas of public health, epidemiology and food safety. And today we're going to hear, I think, one of his most exciting projects, which is looking at the potential impact of the big question, what would happen if rabies that we know is just across the water in Indonesia and making real incursions through Bali and through the eastern Indonesian islands, what would happen if that was to come into Australia? Um, what could we expect and how, how are we going to, as a profession, help to deal with that? So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Ward to take the stage. Thank you very much, Roseanne. It's a pleasure to be here. And yes, it has been seven years since I've been at Sydney. Um, and it's the longest I've ever been in one place at one time, I think, except since I was um, a young boy. So either I must really like the place or maybe I'm getting old. It's one or the other. No, I really do like being here. So, um, yeah, seven years ago I arrived in, in Sydney or came back to Sydney. Um, it's a pleasure today to finish off this Indigenous seminar series. Not a pleasure that the series is ending, but it is a pleasure to share uh, some of the research with you um, today. And I'd like to thank you all individually for being here. Um, given the audience, I probably can thank you individually, Peter and Sabrina and Jan and Anki, and I won't continue, Edwina, thank you. Um, but no, it's, it's nice that you've come along. What I want to do today is give you very much, I guess the other presentations have, very, have been quite big picture and a lot about um, sort of the relationships um, that we form. In this presentation, it, 
is really, I'm a researcher, and this is really about research in indigenous communities. And I guess the message I'd like you to leave with is, it is possible, it's very possible, and it's very exciting, and it's very rewarding. Before I started this, I'd never really worked in uh, indigenous communities, and I must say it's probably been some of the, the most exciting, most rewarding research projects I've been involved with. Just unbelievable, the cooperation and the success. So definitely if you're thinking about forming partnerships and working in these communities, it's possible. It's very, very possible and um, highly desirable. So what I want to do today, this is the research that um, I'm involved in at the moment. It's focused on rabies, and I'll take you through that. I don't really want to give you fine details of the research, particularly given the time um, available. I want to share more the, the experiences as a researcher uh, working in these areas. So firstly, the, the partners. One thing about the sort of project is you need to form lots of partnerships, and that's the only way these sort of research projects work. So in our case, the partnerships principally have been with Queensland Health, and in particular the Tropical Health Unit based in Cairns, and Clayton Ambrew, who's from the Torres Islands, um, and he's been just, just fantastic in helping us uh, get access and facilitate the research. We're also working in East Arnhem, so the East Arnhem Shire is a very progressive shire in that they employ their own vets. Um, so Emma Kennedy um, is the vet. She's a Melbourne graduate and she's helped enormously. And then the animal health workers there, Philippa, uh, Virginia and Sharon. Amrick, who talked last week, and uh, particularly John Scooter was here. Jan Allen, I think, has spoken um, here in the faculty. Bonnie, uh, Bonnie Cumming, who's an educational officer. Um, so they've helped us a lot in facilitating this research. We also work with government, so the Department of Agriculture, the Northern Australian Quarantine um, Strategy, so Beth Cookson and Chris Rod Rodwell. And then in the Northern Peninsula area, and I'll talk about this in more detail, the uh, Environmental Health Office up there have been just tremendous in, in helping us uh, with this research. So, uh, firstly, um, Salome Dura is a postdoc working with me, so she couldn't be here today. So this is Salome. She's from Switzerland. So once again, um, she's, she's funded by a fellowship. So again, when you think someone from Switzerland working in some very remote indigenous communities, you know, if that can happen, anything's possible. So it really is possible to work quite productively in these communities. So this is Salome um, conducting some of the questionnaire uh, work we've done. So firstly, we had this great presentation last week from Amrik, talking about dogs and the relationships, or, or animals in general, but specifically dogs and their relationships with indigenous communities. As they told us, um, in most communities, they're a very important part. You can't assume that in all communities, dogs have always been an important part of the communities. But I think it's fair to say in sort of modern Australia, when you go to these communities, you'll always find dogs. Dogs are ubiquitous and they form a very important part of the community. Um, they're there for protection, they're there for warmth, uh, companionship, hunting, which I didn't actually realise until, until I started this research. They're very important in some parts of Australia for, for hunting, so hunting pigs, for example. Um, and also child minding. It's, it's quite funny when you go to communities, you wonder who's minding who. Is it the dog that's minding the kids or the kids minding the dogs? Because there'll always be dogs around children. And children will be roaming communities, as dogs do, and they, they essentially roam together. So there's a very, very strong relationship there. So it starts very early with a lot of the uh, community members that there's always dogs present. They're spiritual, and, and really I don't have a personal experience of this, um, that, but, but there is definitely in some communities, not, not necessarily all communities, there is a spiritual act aspect to the, the human-dog relationship. And there's also this close relationship um, in, sorry, in terms of um, sharing of bedding, for example, sharing of food. And this brings us to this issue of zoonotic diseases. So there's this very, very close relationship, perhaps more, it's a closer relationship than perhaps you'd find in, uh, say, down south here in a lot of our, our large cities that there's this very close, close relationship, particularly with kids. And you can see in this picture, this is for, from um, uh, Galawinku, um, just the sort of relationship that you'll find. So there's no doubt there's a very, very strong relationship there. Um, in terms of the actual dogs that we encounter um, in communities, again, Amrik um, told us about this, Sophie, when she talked last week. 
you go the whole spectrum. So you can have all the way from what we would consider our normal sort of companionship type relationship, a domestic dog and a family. So it's a sort of one-to-one, -one, very you know, standard sort of relationship. You definitely see that in a lot of communities. In some of the communities, it's very strong. In others, it's not as strong. You have this concept of camp dogs. And the sort of idea here, you can also say community dogs, this is sort of like a resource. So it's you know, one dog to many people. So someone does own the dog. Someone always owns the dog. Whenever you ask or you want permission to do something, there is an owner. But there's sort of a shared ownership. So you'll see you know, dogs are almost sort of lent and borrowed in the community. They're a community resource, and you need to sort of understand that. You then sort of go out a little bit further. You get these dogs that sort of aren't quite they're not always there, they're not sort of a central core part of the community, but they're around and you will see them and they sort of seem to come and go, they might go bush, they might come back into the community. So you have that level and then you have the final level, the wild dog dingo level. And you might think, well, they're right out in the bush, they have nothing to do with what we're doing. But these animals do come into the communities, um, mainly at night, so you do have that interaction and you have that sort of continuity all the way from a domestic situation through to the wild dog. So you need to sort of understand that when you're doing this sort of research. So there's really not much doubt there's this, this very close relationship in, in most communities you go to. You'll have this very strong, very close relationship between, between humans and dogs. So now I'm an epidemiologist, so how does that relate to really my research area and, and my interests? Well, this is really sort of came about, and I'll go through this very briefly, um, given the time, the sort of motivation, the idea of, well, given that close relationship between humans and dogs in these communities, what would happen if, say, some terrible disease came into these communities? What would be the impact? We already have this relationship and a very, very clear pathway of disease transmission. What would happen if something terrible went wrong? So that brings us to rabies, and this is, this is sort of the, the subject of this particular talk. So for those of you, I think most people would know what rabies are, have has, most people would have heard of rabies. Rabies is a terrible disease, a disease of antiquity. I think it's probably one of the oldest recorded diseases in terms of uh, writing. There were laws about rabies, you know, two, three thousand years ago, um, or two or three thousand years BC in Mesopotamia, so current day Iran and Iraq, where there are rules set out. If a dog had rabies, what would happen? If your dog bit someone, what would happen? So we've known about rabies for a long, long time, and most of the world suffered with rabies. Until the late 1800s when, through Pasteur's historical experiments, rabies was one of the first vaccines developed. And once we had a rabies vaccine, in most of the developed world, so in North America and Europe, really rabies became just a really interesting disease, still a very scary disease, but not that important in terms of public health. So, so places like, and this map shows the, glo the global burden of rabies, so, for example, places like South America, there's rabies, but maybe 200 deaths a year. Not a lot. And that's mostly through bat-borne uh, rabies transmission. In North America and Europe, really, there's hardly any deaths from rabies because it's so well controlled through vaccination. So it's not really a big deal, even though a lot of money is spent on, on vaccination programs. If we turn to Africa, you can see there that we can start to see the impact of rabies. So 24,000 deaths. And just to the bottom line here, uh, 75,000, you know, plus or minus, we don't really have good statistics, 75,000 people dying every year from a preventable disease that has a reservoir in animals. So it's quite astounding. I really don't know of any other veterinary di disease or disease that we sort of concern ourselves with that has such a big impact. So that's one person every 10 minutes dying of rabies. So Africa, a huge burden. And Siobhan, who's here, is doing some work in Africa on, on rabies there. In Asia, 30,000 people a year. Again, huge numbers. And in China, from what I've heard, things are really getting out of control with rabies. There's an increasing number of deaths every year in China at the moment. Um, India alone, 20,000 deaths. So you can see those sort of numbers. They're just mind-boggling. When we move down to Southeast Asia, not as many, 800, 900, 1,000 maybe a year, but still an important disease in Southeast Asia. We moved to Australia. We have actually had rabies in Australia, in Australia, three cases. There was one, the very first one was in Tasmania, um, imported case, the other two also imported cases. So these are people that have been exposed overseas and then returned to Australia. So just to clarify, Australia is rabies free. 
It is, except we have Australian bat lysivirus, which looks like rabies, smells like rabies, rabies vaccine works against it, but we don't consider it rabies. Because if we did, then Australia wouldn't be rabies free. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a, a um, political sort of argument. So, so we consider ourselves rabies free. So there's the issue. So Australia is rabies free, but as Roseanne mentioned here, we have what's going in the last probably 10 to 20 years, we have rabies spreading throughout the eastern islands of Indonesia. So particularly we had this classic outbreak in Bali in 2008, which got a lot of publicity, but there's been a lot of other islands which aren't big tourist islands, but have succumbed to rabies. So they were rabies free, and we're getting this jump from island to island, moving eastwards uh, throughout the Indonesian archipelago. So that's, that's a major concern from us in terms of biosecurity. Uh, we've done work on it, and this is from NARCS, the uh, Northern Australia Quarantine uh, Strategy. So Beth Cookson, they did a risk assessment. You can see they categorised here the coastline of Australia and two areas of major concern for a potential rabies incursion. So the top end of the Northern Territory, and particularly Arnhem Land, and then also the top of the Cape. So they're two prime areas where we could see a rabies incursion. So as well regulated, this is a picture I took when I was on a ferry from Thursday Island to Horn Island. This was a guy just moving his dog to Thursday Island to the vet, because the only vet there is on Thursday Island. But this is well regulated. You can move animals within certain zones. There's quarantine there. There's inspection. When you get off a ferry, there's an inspector there and so on. So it's highly regulated. But there is that sort of movement going on. What's more of concern is the illegal movement or the uncontrolled movement. You have illegal activities. You have refugees, you have fishing boats, all in this northern area. And it's so big, so immense, it's virtually impossible to stop everything getting through. So what would happen if one of these boats arrived with a rabid dog? What would be the impact? Well, the impact would be on indigenous communities because that's what's up there, indigenous communities. If it came into, say, Cairns or Darwin, there probably wouldn't be such a big impact because we can very quickly control that. But what would happen if it got into some of our... our communities that don't have those facilities to respond. So really the research questions that we've been interested in is how might uh, rabies spread if it did come in? Uh, what would be the impact if rabies came in? And how could we best respond to such an incursion? What I'm going to do just very quickly, I'll, look, I'll address that incursion issue, but that's not the main point. The main point of this presentation are the other two uh, research questions. So the, um, the incursion sort of um, issue this was really funded by, um, under a project from the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, and this was sort of a risk assessment approach. I'll talk about that very quickly. And then the spread is funded under a program called Wildlife Exotic Disease Preparedness Program that funds this. Unfortunately, that was a victim of the federal budget, so that's been cut, so no, no longer will we have that funding. Going back to the, uh, the sort of the risk assessment and looking at the spread of rabies in Indonesia, one way of informing what might happen is what's gone on in the past. In Indonesia, or the former Dutch colony of the, um, the East Indies, there's great literature, great statistics on what happened when rabies came in. So we went through that, through the, uh, these old journals that are 100, 120 years old, to try and look at the spread of rabies. So we did some of that work to try and inform why was rabies spreading. And it's, it's really the, the uncontrolled movement of animals as pets, uh, military, when the military moves animals, they move dogs and, and they're not subject to, to quarantine. And then um, the commercial activities of buying and selling dogs. Uh, we've also done some work in East Timor. So this is Timor-Leste um, on the island of Timor. Here, so West Timor, uh, part of Indonesia, Kupang down there. Edwina has spent time in Kupang um, and she can talk to you about that later eating rice and beans, I think, most of the time. Um, we've done dog surveys in East Timor. So this is part of a risk assessment. If rabies came in, are there enough dog dogs to sustain infection? And this also relates to, um, to Northern Australia. Is there a critical mass of uh, street dogs or roaming dogs in those areas? So you can see here we work with the university in Dili to do some uh, surveys on, you know, at that stage we didn't even know how many dogs there were in East Timor. And the same thing in Northern Australia, and we've done this in some of the uh, communities we work with, how many dogs are there? And that's part of also a dog management um, issue that, that uh, Amrik talked about last week. Uh, risk assessment work we've done in Indonesia, um, expert opinion, developing risk assessment um, models to try and estimate 
what's the likelihood of rabies moving from one island to the next? Um, and this is some of the practical outcomes. Developing strategies, and this is in, in Dili in East Timor, developing strategies to, to deal with rabies um, if an incursion um, occurred. Okay, so that's all sort of, that's one part of the project, and that's very sort of over the border and what's happening. What's happening in Indonesia, and what are the chances of rabies spreading to Australia? So it's very much a biosecurity quarantine uh, focus. But really, the main thing I want to talk to you about today in the next, let me see, I've got, what, 10, 15 minutes for about 60 slides. Um, so it's going to be pretty quick. I'm going to talk about our work actually in indigenous communities here um, up in the north. So just to put this in context, um, the ultimate aim of this is to develop a model, so a disease spread model. This is a mathematical uh, model, computer-based model, that we can look at if rabies came in, what would be the impact? How fast would it spread? How far would it spread? How many dogs might be affected? How many people might be infected? How much vaccine do we need? How would we manage the situation? So we do that, we don't have the disease here, we need to create a model. But to create a model, what we need is the key part of any disease model, um, a lot of the information you can just get from the literature, the key part is this infection. If you have susceptible dogs, so these might be, you might have 500 dogs in a community, what's the probability that they're going to become infected? That's really something that we don't know and we need to estimate. So that's sort of really where we're going with this sort of research. So it's something called a, a disease spread parameter. We need to estimate what's the likelihood of spread. Now, there's two things that that depends on. It depends on the contact. So anything, whether it's humans or chickens or dogs or cattle, it's what's the chance, for example, if I have influenza, what's the chance that I can contact you in a day or a week or a month? And that's something we can actually measure because we can actually we can observe contacts or, you know, I can talk to you, I can ask you, you know, who did you meet today, uh, go through that. And the other one is, given we had contact, what's the chance of transmission? The latter we usually get out of um, experimental trials, um, out of the literature. So that comes down to it. To develop a rabies model, we need contact information. How often do dogs come into contact sufficient to transmit rabies if rabies was present? So you can go to the literature, there's nothing at all. We don't know what the contact rates are between dogs. Certainly in indigenous communities, we don't really even know what it is in Sydney or Melbourne. But definitely in, in our study area, we don't. So this is the aim of the studies, or the aim of the studies that um, are ongoing, is to focus on, on dog populations in our remote north. And there's some of the reasons that we've, we've done that. So we've, we're working in two areas. So the first area is the Northern Peninsula area. So this is an area, so as it says, Northern Peninsula, it's Cape York Peninsula. So here we have Australia, Queensland, Cape York Peninsula. All the way up here we have Papua New Guinea and then we have Indonesia. So you can see here, when I showed that risk map, that is a potential area where rabies could be introduced. And so we have here the tip of Cape York and then we have the Torres Strait. And the Torres Strait is a series of islands. Essentially, you can very easily get from um, Australia to uh, New Guinea through a series of jumps um, through the Torres Strait. So that's, that's um, our first area. Up here, there's the Northern Peninsula area. Essentially, there's a lot of remote country between these communities and then what's next. So really, there are a cluster of communities right up on the tip of Australia. So there's five communities up there. Um, and these are what we're working with. Uh, so Seisha, this is on the, this is actually where the ferry comes in from Thursday Island. So it's right on the coast. Um, you can see the numbers there. It's a, it's a, all of these communities are very interesting and it sort of highlights um, some of the benefits of working in this area. We have sort of a mix of cultures and peoples in this area. We have, you know, one extreme, we have um, islanders, so Torres Strait Islanders very much, and the other extreme, Aboriginal. And the communities are different and they're also mixed. And what that means is it's really important for then the relationship with dogs. You know, does it differ and different communities, would there be a different impact? So Seisha is very much um, a sort of a, more of an islander type community. Then if we go down, New Mapoon is very much an Aboriginal community and was established, uh, there was a, an uh, original community called Mapoon, which was down near Weeper on the western part of the Cape 
and some of the people there were moved up to, to New, New Mapoon. So it's very much sort of an Aboriginal um, community. Bamaga is then really the administrative sort of centre of this area. It's the largest community, um, very mixed. Um, a lot of the services are there, um, so government people, police and so on. So it's a very sort of, it's almost like just a tropical version of a country town here, you know, even in New South Wales. It's, it's quite typical um, if, if you went there. Um, the other one, the other two, so Imagico, again more um, an Aboriginal community, and then finally Ingenue down south, which is also more um, sort of an Aboriginal community. From a research perspective, it's a really good sort of representation of the sort of the ranges and the differences you might experience in any sort of community in the northern parts of Australia. So this is where we've been working in NPA, uh, our first area. So what we've been doing, getting back to the contact rates that we're trying to do, we're trying to measure. So we're trying to measure, if I have two dogs, what's the likelihood that those two dogs are going to come into contact, sufficient to transmit rabies or something else um, if that disease is present? So how do I do that? So the way we've gone about it is to use these uh, G, um, GPS collars. So they're commercially available. They're in a little plastic case, and I meant to bring some today, but I didn't. I've got about 100 of them back in the office in, in um, Camden. But you can see here quite clearly, they're, in, they're encased in this sort of hard plastic sort of shell. So it's just a little GPS unit that we uh, program. And then what we've done, so we've just bought regular... Uh, nylon collars that you, you get at Woolworths, and we can thread them through because they have these little, these two sort of holes on either end. So they thread through very securely. They work really well. Uh, we've only lost maybe three or four of them in the whole time. Um, and we've tested them for accuracy. So what they do, we set them, put them on the dog, and walk away. And what they're doing is they're recording location every minute. So it's GPS, so satellite fix. It records the latitude and longitude of where the dog is and the time of day. And then we get this series of tracks, and I'll show you, show you some of the data um, that we've downloaded. So it's a fairly simple um, process. So here's an example. This is when we did it. When we first got them, we tried them in, in Camden just to make sure they worked. So these are some farm dogs in Camden uh, just to make sure that everything was working OK. And then we took them up north. So here's an example. They're extremely well tolerated. This was one of my fears. What would happen? Because when you go in these communities, most dogs don't have collars on. And some dogs, you know, they've never had a collar on. So you put a collar on a dog and, you know, some of them will go around in circles for a minute. You know, just, it's just, I don't think they're distressed. I think they're just, it's something very different. Um, but then, you know, once they're used to it, there's no problems at all. And in a lot of the communities, we've just left the collars there. So there's dogs roaming around with red collars and blue collars and they look very um, sophisticated. Um, so this is an example of here, a dog, so well tolerated. This was just one trial we did. Uh, 55 dogs in these communities, these five NPA communities. You can see the numbers there. Um, sort of we, what we do is what we, we call it convenience sampling. Convenience sampling means we just roam the streets. Like the dogs, we walk up and down the streets with the local animal health worker. Um, so here you can see this is Salome with the collars here. Clayton, who's from Cairns, so he's a um, Torres Strait Islander. And then this is Frank, who's one of the local members of the community and is the animal health, um, uh, animal management worker. So we go up and down, because what we have to do, we have to get, obviously we have to get permission, written permission, we have to explain the study, inform consent, and then we have to leave some information. So the people have to be at home. So it can take several days of going back and forth, back and forth, to catch people. So the dog might be there, we can't collar the dog until the person is at home at the same time. So that's sort of a little bit time consuming. Um, so this is just a flow chart showing um, in one trial how things work. So generally, you can see here, collars have worked well. We, put, we had 56 units on 55 dogs. Um, one dog didn't have two units. One unit had to be replaced. Uh, we got back 54 units, and of that, 48 units had usable information. Now, these units are only like $50 each. We could spend like $5,000 on a really top-class GPS unit. But if we lose that, that's sort of, that's a lot of our budgets gone. So we're prepared to lose some of that data for these cheap units. So $50, I think that's a bargain for, for a GPS unit. So this just shows we also do dog treatment. So part of this is also trying to improve the health. And this is an important aspect, I guess, in terms of research. Particularly when you go into these communities, it's not about what you're going to get out of the community in terms of your research. 
I mean, that's important for us, obviously, but it's what you're going to give back to the community. So you have to very clearly demonstrate what's the benefit, more so than any other sort of studies you get involved with. So in this case, the benefit is trying to improve the overall health of the community dogs. So in this case, we're doing treatments. Um, we're doing backline treatments. Uh, we're doing inter so for external parasites, internal parasites. Uh, we had questionnaires. We're also collecting information on dog bites because you can't find out how many people get bitten by dogs in these communities. And that's really important for measuring the impact of rabies. If rabies came in, how many people might actually get infected? Um, so we've been through that process. You can see Salome conducting some of the interviews. We're also, in terms of a, um, a thank you to the community members, we were distributing um, dog food, so, so dog treats, um, to thank them for their participation. So this is the dog food I loaded up on my, my ute to be shipped up to, to, the, Northern um, to the Northern Peninsula area. Um, so I'm going to race through this very quickly. The data management, I don't think I'll actually go into this. We, we programmed these units. They start at a certain time of the day. So, for example, here, this is going to start at Wednesday lunchtime, so at noon, and I'm going to get it to go for another two and a half days, and then it will stop. So you can pre-program these units. The issue is you've got to get the unit back to be able to download the data. So that's the only downside of these cheap units. If you don't get the unit back, you've lost it. So this is just downloading the data, as you can see here. Uh, we, have, we can get, these are cheap units, so we do get errors, but by going through the data, you can tell. If you suddenly get a recording way out here, you know that that's just the wrong fix from the satellite, uh, not from the satellite, but the GPS unit. So you can actually um, clean up the data and remove some of those. You can also tell if there's a car trip. So you get this, you can, because you've got locations, if the dog is traveling at 50 kilometers an hour, you know that there's something wrong. I think Salome looked up the top, the top speed for a greyhound, and I think we set that as the threshold. If any of these dogs are running faster than a greyhound, there's something wrong with the unit, and we take out those, those records. So there is quite a bit of data cleaning that needs to be done. OK, just um, so quickly with the time, this is the example. Uh, these are two dogs. Um, so one in, they were both in Seisha. So Seisha is on the coast. This is where the ferry comes in. You can see this dog, male four-year-old, ninja. And this is over three days. So this is where Ninja's gone. So these are the tracks. Um, this is another one. You can see here, quite, quite um, far roaming. So this is the sort of information we get. It interfaces with Google Earth. And what's nice is you get the collar straight off the dog. You can actually have your laptop there. You plug it in with a USB. Within you know, 30 seconds, you have something like that. You can actually show the owner there and then where their dog's been. And the owners really like this. And so do the animal health managers. Things like, you know, dogs going to school. They tend to go to school at lunchtime and annoy the kids when the kids are having lunch. They'll go, for example, here. This is the, this is the local abattoir, the meatworks. Dogs will hang around there. Um, there's all these sort of these stories that you can either verify or you can show them, no, your dog isn't doing this. Um, something to consider, though, you know, could, you could potentially get some of these dogs in trouble by finding out where they've been. So maybe we have to consider that, the privacy of the dog as well. Um, this is the resort dog, Panda, at Bamaga, just another example. Uh, something else, what we found, just by, by chance, some of these dogs are taking on hunting trips. And this is particularly in the NPA. So this is going up to the tip, the tip being the tip of Australia. You can see these dogs would have roamed around. Then they were probably put in a car and taken up to their owner's favourite pig hunting site. Um, so you can see, and, and that's interesting because that's where we could potentially get some, some interaction between wild dogs and these domestic dogs. Um, and it's quite a phenomenon up in the NPA. A lot of pig hunting, a lot of fresh pig meat is consumed in that area. Um, and we also give back, then we were doing little sort of pamphlets, like laminated pages, we'd send to the owners as well. So they have a record of, you know, thank you for participation in the study, and this is where your dog's been. Um, OK, I'm going to run out of time, so let me just really quickly show you the second site. So two areas we're working in. So this is East Arnhem. So Darwin, there, you can see Darwin here, top end. So East Arnhem, this entire um, area to the east of um, Darwin. A really interesting place if you've never been there. So this is where uh, Kakadu's on, on one side of it, um, on the, the western side of Arnhem Land. Really fascinating place of Australia. So two uh, communities, um, Gapawiak, which is sort of inland. So this is Gapawiak here. 
and then Galawinku, which is on Elko Island, um, right up here. Uh, I've been working with the East Arnhem Shire, so this is Emma Kennedy, who is the vet that the Shires um, employed, who um, goes to these communities. So this is us flying to um, Gapa Weak. Um, the easiest way to get around Arnhem Land is to fly. Uh, this is, it's quite different from NPA, so you can see here, this is sort of a street scene, um, very different sort of community, which is good for us because we want to see how the dogs roam in different parts of Northern Australia to build into the model. So here again, Gapa Weak, you can see some of our dogs, there's one dog with, with our collars there. Uh, this is Philippa, the uh, local animal health um, worker, or the AMRIC animal health worker. Um, here you can see what, another dog on the street. Again, you can see with these communities, you've got this issue of very close to scrubland, to bushland. So you can see here, this is, this is right on the edge of the community. The community isn't large, so you really have to think about the, uh, the wildlife um, interface in, in these sort of communities. Uh, the other community... Um, uh, Galawinku, so this is on the southern end of Elko Island, so this is coming into Galawinku. Galawinku is quite, um, sorry, yeah, Galawinku is quite, um, quite well known. These are some of the major exports from Galawinku. You've heard of the Elko Island Chuki dancers who performed uh, Zorba the Greek, so this is where they come from. Um, Garamal Yakupingu, who I actually got to see perform the year before last, I think it was. He received an honorary, uh, I think, Doctor of Music. Um, at our, our um, ceremony in the Great Hall, and then he performed. Instead of giving a thank you speech, he performed, and it was just astounding. Um, so it's the same, I think there was Kate Blanchett and uh, Kate Grenf Grenfield, uh, a few other you know, notable Australians. Um, also, My Island Home, you've heard of the song? And we think of the Torres Strait and Christine Anu. It was actually composed about Elko Island, so that's, that's really where it comes from. So it's quite, a, quite an important um, part of our, our culture. Um, this is just a street scene. Here's um, Virginia, one of the animal health workers from AMRIC, um, helping us collect information. This is what I think um, Sophie or John were talking about last week with the iPads. So here uh, she has the iPad putting information in. Um, this is some of the data. So, so, so getting back to the, do we have to leave at two o'clock? Probably, okay. This is the sort of data we get. So you can see all the points. This might be just, this is Ingenue. This is this community right on the south of NPA. You can see, all, so this is the sort of information we get back. When we get all those collars back and we download all the information, this is what it looks like. So another example there. What we do is estimate home range and also what's called the utilisation distribution. This is getting more scientific, so I won't bore you with the details, but just to show you the sort of, this is still going into that modelling sort of exercise. So again, that's what the data might look like. We can estimate something called the minimum convex hull. This is an example, one dog called Frodo. You can see all the points there. So these are all the GPS points, and then we essentially form a big circle around them. Kernel estimation is another way of doing this. Again, that's what it looks like. We have this sort of information where the units will, will get lots of information, then we'll get no information. So you get these sort of gaps. They're not necessarily that the unit's not working. If a dog goes under the house, so these are sort of Queenslander style houses, so if a dog goes under a house or goes under a car, the unit will stop working after a few minutes. So you have to deal with sort of this non-continuous data and the time aspect of, of the data. So what we do there, there's some other sort of, let me call fancy techniques that I won't go into now, uh, random, uh, bias random bridge estimation that can sort of take into account that and get an estimation of where those dogs have been. So really this is sort of what we're getting to, the contact rate. So you can see here, this is the information, this is the gold for a disease modeler. So now we're actually, this is what we wanted. After all of that effort, this is what we wanted. So dog two and dog 20, so two different dogs, the contacts per day were 2.2 contacts per day. And this was using, so they came within 20 metres and within one minute of, it, minute of each other, about two times during that, two times per day during that period. Three and 16, 11. So you can see most of them, we get that range. Some of them, these would probably be two dogs in the same household, very high t contact rates. But these are the numbers we need to then put into a model to estimate what would happen with rab if rabies came into Northern Australia. So we do that, we, we can use this very readily in, in a model. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. I'll just summarise what we're doing. So we've, 
Last year we started, we repeated studies this year, and something quite unique is we went back and got the same dogs, um, almost all the same dogs. So we actually know how many dogs died during the period. And we're looking at last year we did pre-wet season, so we've just gone back last month, post-wet season. We can start to look at the same dog, do they change their patterns? Do they roam further before the wet season than after the wet season? We're also looking at um, gender. Do male dogs roam more than female dogs? We're looking at breeds, the you know, typical community dog versus you know, the recognised breeds, do they change? Um, you know, the size of the dog, where they're located, we can start to get an idea of where these dogs are moving. So that's sort of really um, a work in progress. And again, we're estimating those um, contact rates. And then part of this is to develop the uh, disease, the rabies disease spread model um, that we hope to do. We're also doing some work with Jaime with um, genetics and looking to see, is there any genetic predisp predisposition to roaming dogs? Um, maybe we can start to predict which dogs roam more than others. Um, so just the funding, again, we, this Wildlife Exotic Disease Preparedness Program, um, most of the funding, um, ACR, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, we have some money from a um, faculty bequest, and Salome is funded by the Swiss National Foundation. So just this is the team in the NPA, so the, um, the guys we've been working with, uh, some of the team members in East Arnhem Land, and this is Sunset on Thursday Island. Thank you. Mm. Uh, we may have just one quick, very quick question for Mike. Eddie. Hi. So do you see potential super spreader dogs in there that have more contact than others? Yeah, some dogs are, are long range roamers. That's certainly, and it, it's funny, it's sort of, it's like 20%, 15 to 20% will go just way out. And you know, out in the bush, um, they'll go throughout all the communities, um, very different. Most of the dogs, the 80%, are stay at home. They'll go you know, one or two streets, but that's it. So those dogs are really important in terms of disease spread. And what we want to know is, is that consistent? So one of those dogs, the next time we go, does it do the same thing? Or is it just we happen to be there one week, it decided to, to head off? And, and that's something we don't know, but if we can get that information, that's really important to predict where disease might spread. <laughs>